On June 25, 1950, North Korean armed forces crossed the 38th parallel and invaded the Republic of Korea. Two days later, President Truman committed the United States military to aid Southern Korea. Over 1,700,000 Americans served in the conflict, including Walnut Creek resident Woody Ogden. Woody documented much of his experiences with his 8mm camera. Here are some stories and personal home movies of Woody's time in the Army. I was drafted into the Army in, on October 10th of 1951, which act, incidentally was exactly three days after uh, we got married. I was attending the University of California at the time, and uh, she was actually a, a high school sweetheart of mine, and we'd more or less kept in track of each other over a good number of years. Um, but uh, uh, we knew that I'd be going into the service uh, that October, so it was no surprise to either one of us, and we both made plans uh, accordingly. Needless to say, uh, I was rather surprised that the United Nations had become quite so committed at that time, but there was a tremendous amount of aggression from the, the North Koreans, and it didn't surprise me that at some point we had to get very much involved in it. My basic training was at Fort Ord, uh, which is very close to Monterey. Uh, it was a very large camp, and that was the 6th Infantry Division, which had really quite a history uh, in World War II. But at that time, I was uh, indoctrinated why it had become a, a training division. After completing basic training, Ogden was sent to the Port of San Francisco. Here, Woody and servicemen from all over the country began the two-week journey to Korea. From Incheon, uh, we took a train to Chuncheon, which is in the central area of Korea and that was to the 40th Division rear location. Well, the very first impression you get of Korea when you, when you see it was that it, it was so obvious that there had been a war had, take, had taken place. Buildings were hollowed out. You could see pockmarks on the walls of uh, various buildings uh, where obviously they'd been shot at. Um, and, and our first view was really of a former battle zone. It brought the whole thing a little bit closer that suddenly you realize, my gosh, I'm involved in a war. But it's interesting to note that the Koreans knew where the water towers were because that's the only time the, the steam engine would, would stop would be to pick up, pick up water. We encountered, at least at that time, uh, were just uh, mostly youngsters who were selling apples or, or fruit of some sort. first arrived at this Chuncheon, the division rear. I was assigned to the 224th into the unit personnel section. I was very fortunate because uh, I'd had, at that point, uh, three years of college. One of the personnel uh, officers who was interviewing troops, having looked at their service records, uh, grabbed anybody that had had any college background, number one, or, or a college degree for that matter, and number two had a, 
was able to type. <clears throat> and I could type probably a fantastic 25 words a minute at that time. <laughs> uh, when he asked me if I knew how to type, I, suddenly I was able to type 35 words a minute. And so fine, they, uh, they called me out and uh, put me to work in the unit personnel section. That's where I spent my time in division rear for several months, typing out uh, morning reports and uh, things of that nature. I wrote, uh, not every day, uh, but probably two or three times a week. And my wife would write regularly. And I'd get little uh, care packages from time to time, a box of cookies and things like that, which, which arrived uh, in good condition. Uh, and uh, that was also a, a popularity plus <laughs> around too. Because <laughs> uh, you could bring your group of box cookies on occasion. There was only one winter, of course, that I went through. It was very cold. I can't quote temperatures, but uh, uh, I am certain that we were very close to zero. We were issued special clothing to deal with. It. And most notable is the Mickey Mouse boot. Uh, these were rubber insulated uh, boots that you would put on in place of your regular boots and they were very, very warm. And if your feet were warm, you were okay. The only problem was getting out of your sleeping bag in the mornings was a, a very exciting experience, I thought. Well, holidays were no different than any other day. They were just a day. We didn't get any time off or anything special uh, with one exception. <clears throat> and that was the Christmas of, of uh, 1952. And there was prepared for us a Christmas dinner, food that we had never even thought possible in, in our situation, suddenly was, was with us. And uh, we were just absolutely amazed. And the second thing about it was we could have as much as we wanted. <laughs> Normally you'd get your so-called ration, which was adequate, certainly. Uh, but on this Christmas dinner, we could stuff ourselves as much as we could possibly handle. And really, it, it had a, a, an emotional effect on us because this Christmas dinner sort of reminded everybody of home and what Christmas dinners were like. And uh, as I say, it was an emotional experience. We had the opportunity to see one USO show. And it really was a pretty good show. Uh, yes, there were, there were singers, there were dancers. The magician, that really was a very, very funny act because he was very strict and proper and with his cape and his top hat and all this, trying to do uh, magic tricks. And every time he would start to set up for some sort of an illusion, why his uh, helper would start stirring up some mischief of some sort. You just never knew what she was going to do first, but she totally distracted him and uh, certainly distracted the audience to the point where they were looking at her and nobody was looking at the magician. Uh, of course, it was intended to be that way. And uh, it was really, really a pretty good show. We were all told that we were going to march out to the quote unquote airport, which is really a military airstrip. 
because we were going to be the first ones to see a piece of our latest weaponry. We had no idea whatsoever what it might be. And all of a sudden there's this tremendous sound, there's this huge Sikorsky helicopter, which was at the time the largest helicopter that had ever been built. They, they had been built in secret. Our eyes were like pie tins. We had never seen anything quite that large or spectacular or that noisy for that matter. And uh, then they, they uh, proceeded to uh, demonstrate its capabilities. It could pick up an entire rifle squad, which is normally uh, 12 men, uh, maybe less, and transport it to a battlefield location, for example. It could pick up a Jeep. It could pick up an, uh, a field artillery piece. Uh, there are a lot of things this thing could move around. That never could be moved by air before that. Didn't know a th such a thing could possibly exist, but it did. 